Assalamu alaikum and welcome to A Nur the Light. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Whoever recites a word from the Book of Allah will receive a reward of a good deed and ten more like it. This week we spent some time with South African Quran champion Hafiz Muhammad Sheikh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قال إني عبد الله the South African National Quran Finals is an annual event that looks at finding the best local reciters of the Holy Quran. We have produced some incredible talent, and this year is no different. Kari Khafid Muhammad Sheikh walked off as this year's winner, and he will now represent the country in the international finals to be held in 2016. Wow, the competition. This is um, a precursor, or rather a memorization competition of the Quran. So basically what it means is that um, uh, you t you're tested the knowledge of uh, Quran by memory. You're given questions like a few words and you have to continue for about a page and a half or so of, of memory. So this was a national preliminary. The uh, winner of this competition actually represents their country in uh, the final competition which takes place in Mecca, the, the holy city of, of Muslims. I managed to win the national competition which took place earlier this year. Um, where contestants from all over South Africa uh, representing their provinces actually came together and um, I find myself being the representative of the South African Muslim community at the Holy Quran International Memorization Competition in Mecca taking place next year. The recitation and memorization of the Holy Quran can be traced right back to the very first revelation. It is regarded as one of the most honored ways to ensure the authenticity of this holy book. Committing the Quran to memory takes years of practice, but it is regarded as the most reliable way to ensure the authenticity of this Muslim holy book. Through various benefactors, my parents, my family being the key support structure, my teachers, friends, colleagues, different different people have been a pivot in my life in terms of, uh, you know, nurturing me to this position that I find myself in today. It means a lot. It means, uh, you know, like, 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 like an honor, you know, to be the representative, to be the one selected. I hope that uh, I will be able to fulfill this feat and come out tops in the international competition. Kari Khafid Muhammad Sheikh was destined for great things. He delivered his first khutbah at age 12 and has not looked back since. The love of Allah actually was something which was brewed in me by my parents, right from an age that was very, very young. And um, I think continuous recitals at home by my dad and um, various, you know, playing of the Quran in... Uh, the radio and stuff like that. That was the initial inception of this little spark. Studying Quran is hard in itself, but this young man also wanted to contribute to South Africa. It was through an intervention from his grandmother that he decided to find a career which could do just this. Being a doctor also has fulfilling roles. The passion was brewed in me for becoming a doctor from also a young age. I think from my maternal grandmother who um, I had a very close and uh, a very loving bond with and uh, she has passed on now, I ask Allah to grant her the best of paradise. Uh, she was part of, or rather my main inspiration at that time. And um, I remember there was a series closer to her latter stages where she passed on from this world, where she was, um, you know, she had a few illnesses, chronic illnesses. And I think me seeing her in this position and always she being the motivator in my life, telling me that, you know what, Muhammad, you'll become a doctor one day and you should thread this path and things like that. And I think this inspiration led onto my parents pushing me in that direction as well. This is a young man for whom service to Allah is first and foremost. He involves himself in every aspect of life, including being the local chairperson of the Muslim Students Association. I met Muhammad in 2013 at an MSA event. Because I joined MSA, we became friends, of course. And uh, he's a very down-to-earth person. Um, if you look at his age, he's only 21. He's very uh, experienced in education and, and his Islamic education. I mean, the guy got eight distinctions in matric. I mean, he's, he's, he's 21 and he's such a role model to, uh, 
people younger than him and people probably my age because I'm two years older than him and uh, as an inspiration because he's achieved so much at such a, such a young age. The Muslim Students Association serves as a means of promoting the interests of uh, Muslims living in the environment surrounded by lots of influences which may be other than the religion of Islam. So generally it's basically like a hub, a family for which Muslims can belong to, have some form of recognition, have some form of a platform in which they can actually, uh, you know, um, practice their religion in a very um, systematic way, in a very pleasant way, basically having a home away from home. Kari Hafid Muhammad Sheikh is a role model to his peers, his community and Islam. As the next South African representative in the Quran finals, this young man knows what awaits him. One cannot help but feel that he is the right man for the job of showing the world what Muslim South Africans can do. Now there's a young man with a bright future, not only in Islam, but also to the service of the South African public. I must admit, I am humbled by the amount of brothers and sisters who not only serve Allah, but humanity as well. Up next, Street Style. Style for me is knowing how to put together a great look and then which complements your personality and shows who you are as an individual. So that's how I portray, that's my, my style portrays basically. It's to know who you are, be comfortable, and know that if you aren't gonna be dressed shabby or you're gonna walk around in your flip-flops the whole day, you cannot feel the same as a person that is dressed proper, ready for the day, ready to face challenges. So for me, clothing does play a role in that, but it's yet not to be worshipped or to be excessive in it. My clothing sense and my dress comes from the idea that one has to, um, you know, represent oneself as a Muslim, but one can look attractive doing so, as a representation of your religion, also looking fancy doing so. That's the idea. Today I'm basically wearing a nude wide leg jumpsuit, which has a cape attached, so from the back it looks like a dress, but it's actually a one piece. And then I just incorporated a whole lot of nude, natural, neutral shades in my outfit. The inner layer of, of the outfit, I had it made um, because obviously the length of the skirt as it is, is too short. And still I would wear it with a boot to make sure my legs are properly covered. And um, yes, it is for me a, almost a vintage kind of a look. Um, and it's part of my style, yes. The outfit that I'm wearing today is a combination of two kinds of fabrics. The one is with a linen, but not the linen that you use that always creases. Been wearing it most part of the day and hasn't been creasing as it's got a bit of a, a lining, like a wax kind of a covering over it so it doesn't uh, crease so much. And it's blended with a pure cotton. The main accessory obviously would be my hijab, but if we talk about jewelry and that type of thing, I'm not too big on that. I do wear my, my, um, my chain and my earrings but I don't like too chunky kind of jewelry now. Today I just put on a little belt. No need for a necklace or anything because my scarf is already so busy and I have like a little lace top and stuff. So I just thought let's just shoes, handbag and yeah. For me, um, not to show your shape, not to the shape of the body, not to be revealing of the part of your body that we are prescribed to cover is number one for me. And then I think it's very important that we as adults dress in a way that is still appealing to the youth. My dressing used to be like a, or the conventional way of dressing, but nothing traditional or nothing Islamic. And, you know, I made a decision in my life where I want to dress Islamic, but I want to look good in doing so. on the lookout for Muslims who wear their style proudly. If you know of anyone, please get in touch with us via Facebook, Instagram or Twitter. While the internet and social media has taken over the way we receive news, it doesn't mean traditional means are dead. Community news still has its place as discovered. 
community media emerged out of the activism of pre-1994 as an alternative form of media providing a voice to the people. These included posters, newsletters and eventually fully established community newspapers. One of the oldest Muslim community media publications is Al Qalam. The newspaper, which started from humble beginnings, has managed to evolve over time but always remained a trusted source of news within the community. This particular print production speaks to a very progressive strand and trend in the Muslim community. So there was a need for a Muslim voice that responded to a particular context that it found itself in. And this context was largely an oppressive context, uh, a context of racial discrimination, of racial capitalism. And I think that what, that's what perhaps uh, you know, sets Al-Qalam apart from other Muslim community print productions. This is not necessarily a print production that wants to talk about who was in an accident or who got married, but it wants to talk about serious societal issues. And I think that's the thread we've managed to maintain from the 70s to now. Post-1994, these community newspapers benefited greatly from the freedom of expression ensured by South Africa's constitution. Building and reconstructing the social fabric of society has become the role of these newspapers who are alive and kicking to this day. Community news basically are news, views and opinions about the community and what happens in our community, current topics, opinions, that sort of thing. I think it creates a huge platform for community interaction. I think that the more knowledge and information that we disseminate, the better it is for our community at large. Uh, we've had uh, the momentous event of 1994. We're cognizant of the fact that we've reached a context of political democratization but we have certainly not been economically democratized. So the paper tries to focus on how Muslims live on the margins uh, and how Muslims are responding to a context of inequality and how particularly Muslims who live on the periphery of the South African Muslim society are covered. So a range of these social political issues are what we aim to focus on. Due to accessibility, community radio played a significant role in informing the masses of breaking news during the struggle and subsequent fall of apartheid. Radio stations popped up in all communities, much like Radio Al Ansar, an Islamic community radio station established in Durban. You know, radio as a medium is a highly accessible medium um, in terms of getting news to the community. Not everyone has a screen in their car, for instance. Um, so radio, highly accessible, meaning where regardless of where you are in the office or on the road picking up the kids or traveling to work, radio is something you have with you. If there's a strike going on down the road, we will be there. If there is a mass protest that's taking place, we will be there. If there's a um, you know human rights issue that's going on in the CBD, Radio Lansar will definitely be there. Um, you know, a lot of the time, mainstream media kind of falls short in actually getting the people's voices heard as they should be heard. Um, here at Radio Lansar, I don't think we sort of uh, muffle any of those voices that need to be heard. Community news media has grown in leaps and bounds over the last 10 years. Radio stations, newspapers, blogs, social media, as well as television are all contributing to this. From old hands to new tools, the information age is well and truly upon us. In terms of the world going digital, you're always going to have change, you're always going to move forward, but some things can never become obsolete. You're sitting in front of a computer screen all day long at work, and when you get home, sometimes you just want to sit back and relax and hold something concrete in your hand and read. You don't want to be in front of another computer screen all night, so I don't think that newspapers are ever going to become obsolete with it going online, um, it's become highly accessible to everyone. Um, so it's the e one of the easiest forms of media, I would think, and to actually get news um, and put it out there, community news especially, things that interest our community and our listeners. Radio for us, that's what community radio is all about, basically getting the nitty gritty of the community and sharing it with those in our immediate surroundings. One thing is certain, community media is here to stay. There is something for everyone and the South African African Muslim community are lucky to be able to draw from so many sources for their daily dose of media.
just goes to show you that you can never keep a good thing down and our love for knowing things will hopefully keep our community news around for a long time. It's time now for this week's book, tech and app segment. Current gender debates in Muslim societies are explored in Sufi narratives of intimacy by academic and author Dr. Sadia Sheikh. Drawing on the treasured works of Sufism, Sheikh raises a number of critical questions to contribute richly to the prospects of Islamic feminism as well as feminist ethics. With a narrative style of writing, Dr. Sheikh's work is easily accessible to both an academic and general audience. Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lived as a true example for all Muslims to follow. Reviver Sunnah is the latest Android app on the market that has everybody striving to live according to his example. The app has a Sunnah on hand for every question researched and approved by various Islamic scholars. The app also offers other features such as Islamic quotes and stories to inspire. Are you unable to stop yourself from grabbing those yummy samosas at every function? Can you simply not resist those scrumptious, spicy savouries? Well, now you can do that with much less guilt as this new technology allows you to bake your samosas much like making a snack quiche. No oil, less fat and much less guilt when enjoying those family favourites. From the frying pan into the pot, so we'd like to think. Lemise is standing by with this week's delicious dish. So traditionally, soji is served as a starter. It's one of my favorite desserts and one of those delicious treats that you can enjoy any time of the day. And with me today is the very distinguished Bushtak Frey. Thank you so much for having me in your kitchen. Pleasure, pleasure being here. Where does your love for cooking begin? Probably from the time that I used to help my mom in the kitchen. Uh, my mom used to be very good in the kitchen. She used to make samosas to put us through university and school. And I used to help her fold the samosas and also fry the samosas. What is the recipe that you're sharing with us today? It's my mom's recipe for soji. I mean, uh, she created this recipe. I don't know where she got it from or how she adapted the recipe, but she used to sit next to me when I used to do the big digs, the big pots of soji, and make sure that I do it correctly. So what are the ingredients that we need to make your mother's soji? Well, there's a whole variety of ingredients, and uh, I'm not so sure whether the way less people are going to approve of it, but yeah, it's... it's, it's the way less, uh, the Heart Foundation and, and the all of the, on the banking guys and all those guys, but yeah, that's some decent stuff that goes in there, and it's... Uh, well, if it's that good, I'm willing to try. So what are the ingredients that we need? Starting off with butter. Then we've got slivered pistachios. We've got some sultanas over here as well. There's fresh milk, condensed milk, slivered almonds. Idle monk. We've got some ground cinnamon over here. Salt, saffron, egg yellow for the cunnery. Some ground nutmeg, ground elichi, sugar, uh, the tasty wheat, and the boiled water. Those are really the ingredients that we use to make up the soji. Now I know that you always say that good food takes time. So what is the first thing we need to do to get started? Uh, 800 grams of butter. We start with that. We're going to melt down 800 grams of butter first. Okay. okay. And is it salted or unsalted butter? This is salted butter. Okay. Now once the butter is melted, we can add on the tasty wheat. That's one kilogram of tasty wheat which we've got here today. Now we're going to add on some spices. We're going to add on the salt. Thereafter, we're going to add on some ground cinnamon. And how much salt and cinnamon would you say that is? That's one teaspoon of salt. Yes. And about half a teaspoon of ground cinnamon that we're going to be using. And then one teaspoon of ground elachi. We'll add on to that. We'll, we'll add on some more later on to the, when we put in the sugar. But we'll do that at this stage. Okay. Okay, now we're going to let that braise off for about 15 to 20 minutes. That's the time you know it's, it's ready to add on the nuts. And then we'll add on the slivered almonds first. We'll add on this. Uh, this is about uh, 100 grams of slivered almonds that we've got here today. We've got 50 grams of ground, uh, sorry, of, of slivered pista over here today, which we're going to add on to here as well. And when we see the colour starting to change, you get it, it just starts to brown a little bit. We'll add on the liquid. So you're looking for a nice golden hue. What yeah. liquid would you like? Do you want the milk? Water first. We're going to have the water first. First, some boiling water. And how much boiling water is this? This is 1,2 litres of boiling water, which we're going to add on to. to 
with the ingredients. And the one thing you've got to watch when, you do, when this happens, you'll find a lot of steam coming up. Well, then I'll add the boiled milk. There's 700 ml of boiled milk. Which and the milk on. must be warm. That's better because, you know, otherwise, you know, you've got a lovely warm consistency over here. And then if you put in anything cold, you just bring down the temperature and you don't want to do that. So we're keeping everything consistent. Absolutely. And we're trying to retain the heat so that uh, the taste of wheat must cook in that heat. Okay. It must open up and, and, and swallow for a bit. I'm going to let it steam a bit first, okay. right? And, and we'll feel that the soji is done, the tasty wheat is cooked. We're going to add on the sultanas. And how much sultanas do we have here? Um, there's about 100 grams of sultanas as well, which we'll add in here. Okay. And thereafter, we're going to put in the combination of the idle milk and condensed milk. But before we add this in, we'll just take the egg yellow and mix that in here, which will give the soji a much nicer color as well. So okay. we'll, we'll add on the egg yellow to the ideal milk, and we'll then add it in there. It's a nice, rich, vibrant colour. Yeah, absolutely. And then you've got how much condensed milk? That's a half a cup of condensed milk. Okay. Which makes it nice and creamy and sweet. What's left now is we're going to add on the sugar right to the end. We'll let it steam a bit first and we'll add on the sugar. But before we add on the sugar, we're going to spice the sugar. We'll put in one teaspoon of ground elachi, yes. half a teaspoon of nutmeg, ground nutmeg, and, half, and a quarter teaspoon of ground cinnamon. Kilo of sugar. Yep. And then the waiting begins. No, not too long. It's about 10, 15 minutes and then we're ready to eat. And that's my favourite part, the feasting. What inspired your recipe book though? No, I turned 60 last year, thankfully. And I, uh, uh, yeah, and I, you know, I mean, we had a good life and um, we were looking to do something special for my birthday, for my 60th birthday. And we've always had this idea about the family recipe book. And then uh, the side of works with me came up with the idea. So, look, why don't we do a recipe book and tell the story of the family as well at the same time? We then gathered some recipes, and I think there are about 90 odd recipes in the book. And it's all not my recipes only, it's the family recipes. Recipe development then became a family became task, a family so thing, to yeah. speak. Yeah. And they then tested the recipes. And where is your book available? Yes, part of our work for the community. We give these books to different organizations and they can sell it and keep all the proceeds. And that's what we've been doing. I love that story. I love that what is a family treasure has become a gift that never stops giving. So well done to you on that. So smelling this for the last couple of minutes has been absolutely torturous. And I can't wait to get tucked in because after all, the proof is in the pudding. Absolutely. And it smells so decadent. So here goes. And you're joining me. Yeah. And it's so good, literally slides down your throat. There's a reason why this is my favorite dessert, and this is officially, officially the best sorti I've ever had. So thank you so much. So much more I want to say, but I want to have more. No, it's been a pleasure, and I hope you enjoy it. So until I see you next time, I'm having all of this, all of that, and I'm taking some home. Assalamu alaikum. Alhamdulillah, another week, another show. To our Christian family and friends, I'd like to wish you a Merry Christmas. May this be a time of peace, love, and joy for you all. That's it for this week. I'm Mara Mukwanda. Salang Hantle. Assalamu alaikum.